In 1200 AD, a young Celtic boy living in Wales became a page to an English knight. This was the medieval age of feudalism with kings and queens, knights and fair maidens, honor and chivalry, that unwritten code of conduct for knights in battle and in life. Under feudalism, at the age of seven, young boys would be assigned as a page to a knight to shadow and serve the knight's every move, to learn the rules of chivalry and heraldry, courtly etiquette, music, even dancing, to master the science of war and the skills of battle, weaponry, cavalry, strategy, and of course, chivalry, so that when the king needed experienced soldiers, they were available. Well, at the age of 14, the page would continue his apprenticeship as a squire until the age of 21, when he would end his apprenticeship and become a knight, ready to fight for king and country. Well, the young Celtic boy from Wales was assigned to a particular English knight. And when he was about 12 years old, his knight engaged in a fierce battle. His knight fought valiantly and defeated a number of combatants, but against a particular foe, began to falter. He broke his sword and then lost his horse. He then lost his squire, lost his shield, and was about to lose his life when the young Welsh boy jumped into the heat of battle, retrieved the broken sword, fought off the fearsome foe, and not only saved the life of his knight, consequently, he ended up saving the entire battle. Well, news of this boy's extraordinary courage spread all the way to King John of England. This is the same King John who reluctantly signed the Magna Carta at Runnymede in 1215, the younger brother of King Richard the Lionheart, who was off battling Islam's most famous military commander, Saladin or Saladin, in the renowned Third Crusades. Well, King John was so impressed with this boy's courage that he sent him a gift, an Irish wolfhound, a giant dog bred specifically to fight off wolves. Well, the boy spent his teenage years growing up with his trusted Irish wolfhound. They did everything together. They became inseparable, best of friends. At the age of 21, the Celtic boy became a man and was ceremoniously knighted by none other than King John of England. King John was so impressed with this young Welsh upstart that he allowed, in fact, encouraged the newly knighted warrior to court his beautiful daughter. The pair fell deeply in love and were married just a few months later, making the young Celtic knight a young Prince of Wales. His beautiful wife became pregnant a short time later, but sadly, she died giving birth to their infant son. Suddenly, this Celtic knight was left to fend for this infant boy. They lived off of a little bit of farming and subsistence hunting. He had to hunt to eat. So he left his infant son under the protection of his trusted Irish wolfhound, and then he went into the woods of Wales to hunt. After a few hours, he returned from the hunt, but when he rode up to his house, something felt off. Normally, upon his return, his excited wolfhound would rush out to greet him enthusiastically, but today, nothing. So he rode to the back of the home and saw that the back door was open. So he quickly dismounted, rushed to the door, looked inside, and saw that the door to the baby's room was open. So he rushed to the baby's room, kicked open the door, and his worst fears were confirmed. The room was in complete disarray. There was furniture overturned, shredded and torn clothing, and blood splattered across the floor and walls. And standing defiantly in front of the baby crib stood his Irish wolfhound, proudly gazing at the knight for approval. The knight rushed to the crib and looked inside. There was blood and dog hair everywhere. He turned and looked on his dog. There was still blood dripping from the dog's mouth, and he was covered in blood. And so in a fit of rage, the knight unsheathed his sword and plunged it into the heart of his wolfhound. The dog let out a shocked and agonizing yelp as he fell to the floor. Bleeding profusely, but still conscious, the wolfhound ironically gazed at his master for help. But the furious knight ignored the pleading eyes of his wolfhound and instead began dragging him from the room. And as he was dragging the dog toward the door, he thought he heard the sound of a faint cry. He then heard it again. So he let down the wolfhound and walked cautiously toward the sound of the faint cry. And when he reached the back of the crib, he heard it again. He reached down, lifted up the girdle, and underneath the crib, 
in a pile of bloody sheets and blankets lay his infant son, uninjured, unharmed, and behind his baby boy lay a dead wolf. Suddenly realizing the enormity of what he'd done, he lunged back to his wolfhound and desperately tried to stop the bleeding. He ripped off his tunic, tore it in half, and kneeling beside his dog, used it to fill the open wound. He then gently rested the wolfhound's head on his lap, wrapped his arms around the dog, and pressed the wolfhound's chest against his own, slowly applying pressure around the dog's heart to try to stop the bleeding. But it was too late. Lying in the knight's arms, gazing affectionately into his master's eyes, he slowly bled to death and died. The distraught knight refused to give in and just tried desperately to resuscitate his wolfhound again and again and again and again. Rocked with unimaginable guilt, Exhausted and ashamed, the knight fell to his knees, buried his face in his wolfhound's chest, and wept uncontrollably. His neighbors could hear the harrowing sounds of his tormented screams and grief-stricken cries that night, and they grieved with him. They knew the dog. This knight felt so guilty for taking the life of the dog that had saved the life of his son, that after two nights and a day, he emerged from his home and immediately began working on a grave. But this was an ordinary grave. He decided to memorialize his wolfhound with a magnificent monument, a monument with a message. In addition to praising his wolfhound's courage, love, and loyalty, he also memorialized the mistakes that he made that led to his wolfhound's death. Mistakes like rushing to judgment, making important decisions in haste, not gathering critical information before making a critical decision. Not slowing down before engaging in regrettable behavior. Taking the life of something or someone that gives you life. And he placed this monumental grave on a popular path as a reminder to everyone who passed by to honor the courage of his faithful wolfhound and to avoid the mistakes that he made that led to his death. A grave, by the way, that you can still visit to this day in a small village tucked away at the base of Mount Snowdon on the northwest coast of Wales, directly across from Dublin on the Irish Sea. A quaint village appropriately named Bed Gellert. You see, Bed is Welsh for grave and Gellert was the name of the Irish wolfhound, Bed Gellert, or the Grave of Gellert. Welcome to the Vini Vidi Vici Show. I'm Patrick Henry Hansen, your Praetorian historian, your historical oracle, where every week I share with you real stories about real people and real events that has real relevance to your career and income. History that informs and inspires, educates, and entertains, and maybe even brings a tear to every now and then. History is life's greatest teacher, a magical window to the past that can shape your future. It's one of life's great ironies, isn't it? That looking to the past is actually the best way to predict or see the future. Or as my namesake Patrick Henry said in his Liberty or Death speech, that you can only judge the future from the past which is why history matters, why history is always relevant, always in style, and why a page of history is worth a volume of logic. If your mind is a weapon, that means knowledge is your ammunition. So welcome to our historical quest for knowledge, to weaponize our minds, and frankly, to make you a very dangerous person. You see, like a gift from the past to your future, history has identified three skills that you should care most about. Three skills that will make you the most money, the three most sought after, most valuable skills known to man, a trio of skills that when mastered are more valuable than a college degree, more powerful than a family name, more meaningful than a fancy title. You see, 
Every career is enhanced and advanced with the same three skills, persuasion, communication, and negotiation. Skills that Aristotle and the ancient Greeks called rhetoric, oratory, and polemics. Skills the Romans referred to as a skilled triclone. So join our community of sales Spartans and business warriors dedicated to mastering history's calculus for success and achieving victory through history. Welcome to Vini Vidi Vici. Now with the name Patrick, I of course come from good Celtic stock, Irish and Scottish to be exact, and as any proud Celt would, I succumb to my only serious addiction in life. No, it's not the uh, dark ale thing. That's different. Books! I bought about 9 billion books on Celtic history years ago and came across the legend of Bed Gellert. Well, as the proud father of six children and three dogs, that story cut pretty close to home. <laughs> you know, I can, uh, I can sense it. I can feel this collective inquiry saying, doth mine ears deceive me? Did I hear him say he has six children? Yes, you heard me correctly. Six kids and all boys, except for the five girls. So one boy and then five little ladies in a row. Now the story of Bed Gellert is a powerful story on so many levels. And I've actually come across a number of other stories over the years that seem to mimic the premise of the Bed Gellert story pretty damn tight. For example, in Disney's classic film, Lady and the Tramp, really an exact replica of the Ged Bed Gellert story uh, evolves when the you know giant, evil, nasty rat enters the baby's room, presumably to kill and eat the infant who was resting peacefully in his baby crib. You know, the tramp then tracks the rat to the baby's room has an epic showdown, ultimately killing the rat and saving the infant. But in the process, destroying the room and knocking over the baby crib and furniture, and of course the baby was in it in that movie or that film. So instead of being rewarded for his heroism, he's accused of attacking the infant. Remember the story. And he was sent off to be put to death at the dog pound, only to be rescued when the parents discover the dead rat behind the baby's crib and rush to stop the dog's execution. It's the legendary Bed Gellert story to a T. Now, although the story or the legend of Bed Gellert is claimed to be fashioned after a true story, in authentic Celtic style, it's clearly dualistic in nature, meaning it's likely based on both reality and a dramatic metaphor about life, similar to, say, like a, like a, a Greek tragedy. Bed Gellert is considered a metaphor for opportunity symbolic of the opportunities that we have in life that we sometimes accidentally or inadvertently kill and live to regret it. Now, the reason I share this story in today's show and in two of my four trainings, actually, so I actually have four trainings, Spartan prospecting, Spartan selling, Spartan presentations, and Spartan negotiation. Well, in my Spartan sales and my Spartan presentation training, I actually include this particular story. And the reason I share this story is because it really has some strong parallels and some lessons to be learned with regard to selling and presenting. And let me give you the real big one. The reason that I share the Celtic dog story is because salespeople sometimes accidentally kill their own dog. In other words, they inadvertently kill otherwise winnable sales, kill otherwise winnable opportunities. And sadly, most of them have no idea why the dog died, completely unaware that in many cases, they're likely the one who killed it. Now, there are lots of ways that you can kill winnable opportunities, of course. However, there is a primary suspect, a primary culprit. The behavior most responsible for the premature death of otherwise winnable sales opportunities is show up, throw up selling behaviors. Verbal vomits, data dumps, popularly referred to as uh, Spray and praise, or ready, fire, aim sales, uh, shrapnel selling, shotgun selling, show and tell selling. I mean, you get the idea. Sellers who deliver premature presentations before exploring and really understanding a buyer's PBMs, primary buying motives. I mean, it sounds so innocent, 
but it actually has devastating effects on sales. And sadly, most salespeople aren't even aware of it. Show up, throw up is like the love child of your mistress's boyfriend. <laughs> Bound to have a few character flaws. Now, I've trained a little over 100,000 sales people from all over the world, from Sydney to South Africa, from Munich to Mexico, from London to Auckland, France and Spain, Canada and 49 states. Still missing North Dakota. I can tell you unequivocally that the number one selling disease worldwide is this topic. It's show up, throw up sales habits and behaviors. It permeates virtually every sales culture and is present in every sales environment. It's ubiquitous. Jumping in too soon with a premature presentation without fully knowing a buyer's background, needs, problems, pains, issues, delays, dilemmas, dissatisfactions, desires, motivations, hot buttons, whatever words you're using. I mean, combined, all of those, we call those PBMs, primary buying motives. Way too many sales are lost each day because salespeople show up and they throw up on the buyer. They get a little window of opportunity after a little meet and greet and just boom, they start doing a verbal vomit, a data dump. Oh, they show up and they throw up. By the way, the show up, throw up is appropriately acronymed. That's wordsmithing. I don't think there's such a word as acronymed. Oh, there might be. No, there wouldn't be. No, I'm making one up. Wordsmithing today, acronymed. Show up, throw up is appropriately acronymed. Shut up, show up, throw up. Serendipitous, I know. I, just, I live a magical existence. <laughs> just worked out that way. Shut up, show up, throw up. But it's a good reminder to shut up instead of show up and throw up. <laughs> now, I know most of you are watching saying, uh, maybe a little, but um, not really. I don't think I do that that much, Patrick. I mean, really? You, if you're in sales, I'm guessing this is happening more frequently than you would anticipate. I mean, uh, when we would do a lot more just consulting and coaching along with the training, it was pretty amazing. I did a little exercise with a team, and then we followed up with some one-on-one -on -one stuff, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't trivial. I mean, salespeople started to recognize, holy crap, I'm doing this all the time, actually. And I literally was about five minutes ago telling you, Patrick, I didn't do it at all. That happened over and over and over and over again. So just keep in mind, if you're kind of saying to yourself right now, no, I don't really do that show up, throw up. I mean, there's a chance that's true, but it's highly unlikely if, if you're in sales. Um, I mean, just keep in mind that virtually everyone living in English-speaking countries is guilty of it. I mean, myself included here. Well, I can kind of prove it to you as well. So if I were to randomly grab 100 sales reps off the streets of your local town or city, New York, Cleveland, Edinburgh, Phoenix, Sydney, Miami, Melbourne, or Excremento, sorry, I mean Sacramento. If I were to randomly grab 100 sales reps off the streets of your local town or city, and I brought them into our, our offices in San Diego, the PH Squared offices, and I said to them, hey, sit down. Uh, I'm interested in what you're selling. Tell me about it. What would 99% of them do? Uh, yeah, I think that they would show up and then they would just start to throw up. They'd talk, they'd tell, they'd pitch, they'd present, they'd demonstrate, they'd advocate. They'd start heaving verbal vomit all over me, the buyer. They'd deliver a giant data dump. But that blessed 1%, that more cerebral sales rep, they would show up, but they'd get the buyer to throw up. You see, show up, throw up is fine, as long as it's you, the salesperson, who shows up, and the buyer who throws up, then it's great. That's actually what you want. You want to get the buyer to throw up, to talk, to tell, to describe, to find those PBMs. You know, instead of immediately jumping into a presentation, or going into what we call presentation pitch mode, the cerebral seller, the Spartan seller, goes in instead to what's called Socratic mode. Uh, instead of the presentation pitch mode, they go into the investigation and questioning mode, or what I like to refer to as the IQ mode. 
the investigation and questioning, IQ, the IQ mode. It's a higher IQ. They focus on what to ask rather than what to say, question marks instead of exclamation points. If they've read any of my books, but primarily the DNA selling method, um, I would assume that that's what they'd use if they've been trained in it. It's a four-step question-based selling strategy that follows a rational probing sequence that prevents traditional show-up, throw-up behaviors. Because you can't do both. It's impossible to do both. When you DNAS well, you're never that traditional, predictable, regrettable, cheese, bar, cheese ball Charlie, loud mouth, back slapping phony that gives the rest of us a bad name. But I digress. When sellers launch into presentation pitch mode, which regrettably in our trainings, I just happened to be about two weeks ago again. I'm gonna have to change that up actually. Sometimes at our trainings, by the end of the second day, <laughs> the presentation pitch mode, it's the, the PPM mode, so they call it PP mode. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it's referred to it by its acronym. Oh, wow. Why I shared that with you, I have no idea, <laughs> so back to it. Um, a lot of salespeople, when they are throwing up, think that they're selling, but they're not. It's too fast, it's too soon, and without first identifying those PBMs, without conducting at least a modicum of investigation, they accidentally are building barriers instead of bridges, castles instead of conversations. The classic feature dump or data dump, sometimes called shotgun selling, um, sellers shoot a bunch of sales shot at the buyer and hope some of it sticks. I used to call it shrapnel selling. When our weaker sellers would toss over, I called them product grenades in hopes that some of the shrapnel would, you know, the features and benefits would hit its target. Regardless of what you call it, the data dump, the feature dump, the show up, throw up, the shrapnel, shotgun selling, it's all the same behavior and it kills otherwise winnable sales opportunities. Let me give you some specific examples of how showing up and throwing up can kill winnable opportunities. So I had a friend of mine, a genius friend, like the smartest human being I've ever met, uh, an Alan Turing type. He had four degrees, a degree in mathematics, a degree in physics, a degree in computer science, and a degree in history. And he was a programmer for a company that I worked for in the uh, early mid-90s. And anyhow, he was socially awkward, uncomfortable, but he, he and I shared an interest in Teutonic history. He was 100% German. And, so, you know, we got talking one day and I actually became friends with him. Well, he wanted to buy a truck and he was nervous about it. He's like, man, yeah, I don't like that. I get stumble and my, will you help me? So I said, sure. So we went to a Ford dealership and uh, pull in, rep approaches us. We're looking for a truck. He takes us over to this gorgeous truck. It was, it was phenomenal, actually. It had a nice lift kit. It was just beautiful. It had all the bells and whistles. And he kind of circled us around it. And when we got to the engine, he started to talk about V-chip technology. So this is probably 2001 to 2003. I don't know the exact date. Sometime around that. But he starts talking about that V-chip. And he goes on and on and on about this V-chip and how it's a computer that's embedded into the, the engine of these Fords and that when it recognizes additional torque on the engine, it'll kick in additional fuel and give you extra horsepower. And I mean, pretty awesome. And so the rep says to me and my friend, he's like, you know, cause we are literally right at the base of the Wasatch Mountains. I mean, there's just a wall of mountain right behind us. And so the rep says, you know, when you're, when you're pulling your trailer, when you're pulling your boat, when you're pulling your jet skis, when you're pulling your snowmobiles and you're going up that mountain and everybody else is slugging, chugging along. Well, that V-chip's gonna recognize that extra torque, give you that extra horsepower. You're gonna blaze past all those losers and leave them in your exhaust, man. So what do you guys think? I, I was pretty damn impressed, actually, but I wasn't the one buying the truck. So I looked at my friend and said, uh, what do you think? And being more cerebral than I am, he said, well, I don't have a trailer. I don't, I don't have jet skis, I don't have snowmobiles, I don't have a boat, and I don't want to pay extra for something I'm not going to use. The very feature, the very capability, the very benefit that the sales rep thought was making the sale was accidentally killing it. 
this gentleman goes into a very high-end cutlery store for like uh, chefs and things of that nature, and he's looking for uh, these sets of knives. So he goes in, looks at various sets of knives, and he kind of stops on a particular set. So a rep walks up to him and says, hey, uh, you know, can I help you? He says, yeah, how sharp are these knives? And the sales rep says, oh, these are yeah, super sharp. Uh, these have a particular metal that they're made with. There's some alloy that's mixed in. It allows these to be sharpened on a level that most can't be. In fact, these are actually sharpened with laser technology. And the uh, buyer says, oh, well, I'm buying these for my mother, and she's got arthritis. I'm worried she'd cut herself. <laughs> I, uh, when I would do consulting, training, and coaching, so I'd go into clients. This is probably up until about five or six years ago. So I did it for almost 15 years. But I'd go into a company. I had a partnership with Salesforce.com, and so I'd help them set up their CRM system, how to track, manage, forecast, and report accurately. We would then train the reps on the big four skills: prospecting, selling, presenting, and negotiating. And then I would go and coach in the field with their top reps. Well, um, I went out with a particular client. We had done the consulting. We'd done the training. And a, a really good rep, their top rep, was up in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. And he was going after a couple of big accounts. And so I went with him on these. And the, the company, this was a software company, they had just released this multilingual support uh, within the technology and also with customer support. And it was, a, it was a big deal. Well, the rep does a lot of good things, meeting with this business guy in his office. And then he starts going off on this new release that they just had about multilingual. And you can have it in French and Spanish and in Mandarin Chinese and this and that. It was probably only three or four minutes. It felt like an hour. But I'm looking at the buyer, and I can tell the buyer absolutely has no interest in this at all. And the seller's not seeing it. I think because he's excited about this new you know, module sell. Well, the buyer finally cuts him off and says, hey, man, I don't mean to be rude, but I only do business in North America. I don't need I, English is fine for me. I don't need it in anything else. I mean, foreign language to me is like Canadian. Like, it's all English. So the rep's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, totally get that. Um, just wanted to make sure, well, that you're, you know, you were aware. That you, you know, if you ever grow outside of it. He started to kind of backpedal. And, man, I swear, all the positive mojo that was built up prior to that just got, like, sucked out. Just gone. I don't know. I can't explain it. But I've seen that happen so frequently, you know, just that these are fragile, especially on complex committee-based sales with elongated sales cycles. You get a sophisticated buyer in an environment, and small little things can kind of pivot that. Well, show up, throw up, oh, that is so bad in that case. Well, when he started doing the verbal vomit about all that multilingual, he turned that buyer off. And I could tell prior to that, this guy was fine. He was going right with it. Um, I mean, I myself have been guilty of this numerous times. And let me share with you one quick example. I had a Fortune 50 call me. A Fortune 50. One of their super high-end execs read my book, Sales Side Negotiation, and loved it. So he basically passed down and had these their educational departments. Uh, three people set up a conference call with me. So I'm on the call with them. And we're talking about conducting sales side negotiation training. And I'm DNASing them. I'm questioning them. I'm finding out what their PBMs are. And I'd say probably 25, 30 minutes into the conversation, one of the ladies, who had been a little more cold, I could tell, on the phone, but she said to me, hey, Patrick, um, quick question. How much do you focus on prospecting? Now, rather than me eat my own dog food, I'm about to kill my own dog. I didn't practice what I preached, I threw up. Instead of saying to her, oh, well, why do you ask? Or is prospecting important to you? Or do your sales reps prospect? Or how much prospecting do you need? There's a hundred good questions I could have asked. But instead, I answered it. I took the bait and I started throwing up on it. Oh, yeah, we, uh, it's a big focus of ours. It was the first book I ever wrote. My first corporate American job was in prospecting. I mean, I have a real passion for proactive lead generation for sales reps, and we teach them how to you know, build pipelines that are bursting with qualified opportunities and the skills to close them. And boom, I'm just throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. Well, towards the end of that little vomit, she's like, oh, okay, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I was concerned about that. I, I saw that there was a pretty strong emphasis on your website on on prospecting. You know, that's just we, that's just not something our reps do. We don't we don't do the the, the prospecting. I was like, well, you know, then we just wouldn't do that training. I have four different trainings, and I don't you know cross pollinate my. I, to this day, I can't figure out why she didn't want to understand that. It's not that she couldn't; she didn't want to. But uh, up to that point, that was a great call. And at that point, it did. It kind of destroyed some of that mojo. There are some other factors, of course, going on that were a little more political. But at the end of the day, I threw up, and it hurt me terribly. I mean, I really think that if had everything gone perfect to that, I would have won that sale. And I didn't. And I blame it on myself for doing the show up, throw up, killing my own dog, killing a winnable sales opportunity had I practiced what I preached. So, you know, it's like a knee-jerk reaction sometimes. You get caught off guard. We all do it on occasion. But, well, you really want to guard against it because it is, whatever you're thinking right now, it's way more damaging than what you're thinking. In our training, sometimes I have time to break it down. Not always, but break it down. And it takes a little bit of time to show you exactly why and how this is so dangerous psychologically. I mean, there's a reason that that, that impacts the buyer the way it does and why it kind of just turns off some of the, the, the positive attitude and responses you've been getting. Why it sucks it all out, I still have no idea. I don't think anybody does. But there is some rationale, some reasoning behind why the show up, throw up behavior actually fosters other negative behavior. We don't have time to go into it on this video. I mean, it's about a 10, 15 minute conversation, but it's fascinating because when you learn the dangers of the feature dump, the data dump, the shrapnel selling, the shotgun selling, the show up, throw up selling, uh, it's easier then to remember to not do it. So be careful. Just be careful. I mean, you don't, it, it, it reminds me of a doctor hitting your knee with, it, sometimes it's almost, it almost seems impossible not to respond when a buyer just tees it up for you. <laughs> And sometimes it's tough. It'd be tough to just not take it. Well, let me conclude with a, a final gem, a serious takeaway from today's show. It's one of my cardinal rules for selling and worthy of notation. That means writing it down for my millions of raving fans in Winnemucca. You ready? Here it is. Always get a presentation before you give one. Always get a presentation before you give one. If you follow that little gem, that piece of advice, it will be the rare occasion that you are a show up, throw up salesperson. You'll never be that traditional show up, throw up sales rep if you follow that advice. I hope you enjoyed today's uh, program, enjoyed the legend of Bed Gellert, and feel like you're walking away with a few reminders to avoid the show up, throw up behaviors. Be sure to join us next week our next edition of the Vini Vidi Vici Show, where I'm going to take the mystery out of history by breaking down Spartan King Leonidas' battle against Xerxes and the Persians at the Battle of Thermopylae and show you why and how it relates to your sales performance, and it'll blow your mind because it does. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Patrick Henry Hansen, your Praetorian historian, your historical oracle, guiding you to business, sales, and negotiation victory through history. Vini Vidi Vici. As always, my fellow sales warriors, drive fast, take chances, and remember that business is war, that sales is the battlefield. Be Spartan. <laughs>